Hi, so you already know about marks and channels and you learn also a little bit about how to start creating visualizations with the tree, data binding and things like that. But now let's try to connect the theory with practice. So you remember this table and this is basically a list of the different magnitude channels that you can use with quantitative data and identity channels that you can use with categorical data. So now what we want to know is how can you encode such thing on the tree? So here we have a basic notebook and we are going to be showing at least some of the ways of, of using each one of these channels. I downloaded some data from one of the Vega data sets. This is a Penguin um, a data set that contains both categorical and quantitative information. So the first thing I'm going to say is that I'm going to create, uh, select one of the quantitative attributes that is going to be in this case, the big length. And then I am going to get uh, filter and making sure that the data contains only attributes that have that don't have a null value in there. So let's start looking at position. So when you start creating visualizations with this, let's do a very basic one. So remember uh, the typical way of doing this is that you need a place to draw. So we can just create an SVG for this. Um, and the most basic thing that you can do is just return this. And then uh, remember that since this thing is a selection, then when you're doing a dot node, what you're getting in there is the element, the HTML element that you can actually visualize. So then the other thing we can do is change the view box. Remember, this is an attribute from HTML that encodes, um, that says that the SVG, whatever size it has, it's going to be distributing this many pixels. So since in observable the width is reactive, depending on the <coughs> excuse me, the width of the window, then pretty much what this does is that it creates like a, a fluid uh, a chart. So I also had a have a height variable down there. So that way we can do this. And then um, as you can see here, the height is not that big, and that's why this one is so small. So if you want to actually draw those, remember we have the data in here. So the basic thing that we can do is that we are going to create a grouping that is going to be just uh, an append in here. And then we are going to do an attribute so we can do a transformation for this uh, with a translate. And remember that we are going to be using in this case the margin left and uh, the margin Top. So this is a common practice that is going to be extremely useful. So we can have space for drawing axes. Uh, so actually we are creating a, a grouping that is going to be displaced in there. Now, now that we have this grouping, then we can select all the rows in there. So now I'm selecting by class. I'm going to say, do a data binding with the actual data that we have. And then I'm going to create, let's say, for instance, start with circles for this. So remember that when you create circles, you need to change three attributes. Like the first one is going to be what is the width of the elements. And then, of course, you need to close this. Uh, <clears throat> and then now I have like 300 dots on the same position. And then I have to start distributing on the screen. So that's kind of like the mark that I'm using in there. We can make them a little bit bigger. So now if I want to show them in a position with common scale, the way that you distribute them is changing the attribute uh, CX and the attribute CY, okay? So uh, let's say that we set like a fixed uh, CY to be something like uh, maybe height halves or something like that. And then for CX, I am going to, like for the moment, start with a fixed value. But then remember, if I want to distribute this, uh, depending on the data, so I can pass an accessor function, and in that the way of doing that is creating a function that takes one parameter, and the first parameter is going to be the datum, and then uh, we can pass, for instance, like the quantitative attribute that we have. So when you do that, then you can see that we have all of these values. They are not really moving much, because when you take a look at the actual values for the, the big length, is 39, and it's not going to change that much. So if you actually want to distribute that on the screen, then you create a scale. So all of this just to say that when you want to create a position with common scale on D3, the way that you do that is that you create a D3 scale linear. Usually you can create other scales like scale log and things like that. 
and then you set up your domain to be uh, the extent, for instance, of your data using uh, d.quant attribute as my uh, accessor attribute. So basically what this is doing is that this is going to return the domain, like the whole extent of the data set. So it's going to take, return two attributes in an array, like the minimum value for data.quantity attribute, in this case, the big length, and the maximum value of that. That's going to be my domain. And for the range, remember a scale is something that goes from the domain of the data to the range of the pixels. So in this case, we can go from zero to width, or since we actually have um, the margins, then we can go from margin left to width minus margin right and minus margin left. We're actually like something else I like doing that you already saw me doing was uh, taking all of this and then putting like a I width in here that is going to be this. So then it can be something like this. So, and then having done that, or actually now that we have that, then we can actually start this from zero. And now I have a bug in here, so it could be this one, this one close that, perfect. So having this scale in this, so instead of passing the actually the actual big uh, length, we just pass that through the scale. And now you have a scale that moves uh, on the screen. And if you want to see an axis of that, then you can put that, like for instance, in here, we can append another G and then say that we are just going to create a D3 axis um, top, for instance, for X, and that gives us an axis, a nice axis that, that you can see in there, okay? So again, if you want to create a position over common scale, and remember that Tamara calls that, that express, then basically what you do is that you can create a scale linear as we did in here. If you want to use a different scale, you can also use um, other ones like a scale pole, a scale log, or things like that. But for the moment, let's leave this one. Now, now that we have that, what if you want to create, like for instance, a position over an unaligned scale? So basically all of the dots in here are starting on the same position, like starting at the minimum value that you can see in here. Actually, a nice trick that we can use here is just to say that this is going to be a nice scale, so it doesn't end on um, like fractions of the number. So now we can actually see the, that it's going around 32 to 60. So uh, if you want to do the same in here, actually the idea will be using also scales, but using scales for each one of the dots. And then you need to create a reference for them. So in that case, uh, we are not going, like I don't have a space for all of them. So basically what I'm going to do is that I am going to create in here like a sample of the data. And then basically I'm just going to take, say, like the first five elements, okay? So this is taking a slice of the array and it's only returning those first. I'm going to keep the scale to be the same one, um, but instead of, of creating one axis for each one of those, what I'm going to do is that I am going to join a grouping and inside that grouping, I am going to be doing the the drawing of the axis, okay? And then uh, the nice thing is that inside that, uh, that grouping, I can create all of the circles that I want. So I can create another a circle like this. And then basically, um, instead of doing that for everyone, then we can do that only for the sample, the sample data. <clears throat> so now I have uh, five of these. I also have five of these, but they are all drawing on top of each other. So uh, what, we're, what we can do with that is that actually I can displace the whole thing using here uh, transform and then uh, translate and then on X, I'm not going to change it for the moment. And then on Y, I'm going to use the index of that multiplied by, I don't know, like 50 or something like that. As you can say, see, it is complaining that it doesn't have I because I'm not passing this as, again, it's still um, through an accessor function, but then I can do it like this. And then using that, uh, I now started creating these elements. I can now have something smaller for this. I can also say that these aren't going to be that far away. Let's say like it's only five points. I can also make the dots a little bit smaller so we have more space and then start separating this a little bit more. And, and then the other thing I can do is that instead of creating like a, because they are still aligned, 
So I'm actually going to be changing this value using um, math uh, random. And this is just for the sake of demonstration. So I can do this. So now they're changing. And then on top of that, this scale, I'm going to say that this is going to be like a sixth of the other one. So now you can see all of those elements. And just because like we have a smaller axis in there, I can say this is only going to have three ticks. And now you can see something closer to what we want. In this case, for instance, we can say this is going to be like twice as much, uh, maybe uh, 1.5 or something. And you get the idea now. So now you can see like maybe we can make this um, out of 0.7. So it is now randomly distributed. And now you can see that each one of those dots, it's on a expressed scale or an, uh, a, like a linear scale, but they are all starting in different positions. But now they have a reference so I can know where to put the, all, them, all of them in there, okay? So <clears throat> that's for that. Uh, now let's go with uh, what do you use for, for instance, for encoding length? So when you're encoding length, you cannot use um, a point because the point doesn't have a length. So we have to change um, the mark for that. So in this case, we can use, for instance, a bar. So bars, remember, they do have X and they do have Y, uh, but they don't have CX and Y. So I actually can get rid of this. Instead of radius, I'm going to have a width. And then I can say it's a width of five. And then uh, instead of changing that, I'm, I just need to change this one. And then, um, sorry, this is going to be height. And then they are all they can all start in the same position. And then for Y, so let's start for this. Uh, and now you can see we have, uh, oh, it's not a bar. It's a rectangle, sorry. So now you can see I have all of my rectangles one on top of each other. And then if I want to separate them, then I can use another scale, but so uh, to avoid confusing you, let's just say that I'm just going to create an accessor that again uh, distribute things depending on uh, uh, the uh, I element. And now you can see like this is pretty much like a, like a very compressed bar chart. So again, when you want to encode things with length, you still use a scale linear. The scale linear is still going from zero. Uh, to, to that element, and then the length is the one that it's actually encoding. Now there is a caveat with this, and it's caveat, or however you pronounce that, and is that um, when you're using length, you shouldn't start your scales in the minimum volume. So instead of doing this, a uh, good thing I remember, uh, we should be starting the domain on zero, and then this is going to be my maximum, and then we can close it like this. So that way I'm forcing things to start in zero because when you're seeing things as a bar, then they are encoding that those elements in there. If you want to have like separation, for instance, you can do something like this and maybe times five plus one. And, and again, in a real implementation, I will do it uh, um, in a little, like using actually scales, uh, but in here, uh, um, uh, I can just, Put it like this just for separating the the different elements that that you have in there okay so let me see if i can get them to show separately there you go so basically now i'm just moving like each one of the the, the bars into a different position so that's how you encode the scale so again for encoding position you use a scale linear and then you change the cx or the x position depending if you're using rectangles or circles if you're using position on an online scale, it's exactly the same thing. You just have to be careful. In this case, the key was that we created a grouping and then we translate everything. And then from there, you start the scale. On length, usually you start from zero. And in this case, I didn't assign a, an X attribute because they are all starting in zero. So that's easy. And then the length, you're, we are just changing the width. So let's go to the next one. What about tilt? So tilt, it's a little bit more interesting. So in this case, what you want to change is the angle of what you're doing. So for that, actually, I think I can copy this one better. So in there, instead of doing this, <coughs> we are not going to have a scale. Like, sadly, you don't have scales that easy like that. I'm going to change my, um, my scale to go from X. I'm going to call it angle. And I'm still going to be encoding this. But now I'm going to be encoding that with an angle. So in this case, 
I can say I'm going to go from 0 to minus 90 or something like that. Now, I'm still, I can still show rectangles. I can still have them with that height. Um, actually, I'm going to keep them all of the same length, like say 50 pixels. Let's say that they all go on Y. Let's put them to be on, I don't know, height, um, two thirds of height. And then for <coughs> the attribute X, let's put them in the middle of the screen. So now I have all of the bars in there and now I need to start applying the angle. Okay. So for applying the angle, what you can do is that you can actually, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you can change also with a transform. And I think I'm going to need to change something else in here. And then you can say rotate. And then if you say, for instance, rotate minus 45 degrees, I think, and then uh, you say where do you want to put them uh, in this case for instance uh, two with halves and then this can be hide this and of course i am missing a parenthesis so now all of the bars are 45 degrees so this is the parameter that we can change and we can use the scale since we have a scale that goes from the domain of the data into angles it's just a matter of using that in here so actually excuse me so i can just pass my angle applied to a d dot quantitative attribute and then since this d in order to access that this has to be an accessor so i just pass that as a function and then i have all of the values in there if i want a longer distribution like going for instance from zero to 180 degrees <coughs> so i can separate it like that Again, if like this one, it's starting on zero. Uh, this one doesn't encode, like the angle is not encoding the same as length. So I can actually go back to use extent. So actually I'm starting from the minimum point to the maximum point. Then maybe this one uh, can be a little bit thick, uh, thinner. And then you have all of the values in there. You can, you can also add some marks to say like this is uh, uh, zero is going to like, or these values. So it's kind of like making your axis manually. But the key here that I wanted to convey is that if you want to use tilt or angle, basically what you need to do is change your scales. So you go from the same domain, but you change your range. Now you, you can use angles for that. If you want to use the full circle, you can use that too. And then in this case, we're using an SVG attribute that is the rotation. Now let's go to area. So area, it's very similar to uh, what we have been doing. So actually in here, like, let's say that we put it like this and then we start, oh no, sorry, I want the, this one. So if you wanna use area, uh, since we are using circles and you, you can change this attribute uh, radius. So basically in there, what you can do is that you can say, this is going to be my radius. You can say this is going to be a scale linear, uh, or actually for the moment, let's let's create another one. Uh, so I'm going to copy and paste this, <coughs> and then this is going to be a scale linear. Uh, since we are talking about areas, like no area whatsoever should be zero, and then start from there. So again, we should start with zero, and then this is my maximum. And then the radius, since we are changing the radius, like we can say this is going to be a maximum of 20 or something like that. Okay, this is basically uh, the radius of the circle, right? So then you can just pass exactly the same thing in here and then say this is the radius of D dot uh, or D on my quantitative attribute, passing that by the scale. And then all of a sudden you have your, your values. Uh, you can also distribute them randomly on the screen if you want, or in this case, we're doing double encoding, but it looks better for, for showing that. So. One of the keys here though, is that you shouldn't do this because when you think about that, you are not changing, like in perceptually, what you need to see, it's the area. But what we are changing is the radius. And remember that the area changes uh, in a quadratic way in relation to, to the radius because area on a circle is PR square. So since we are changing R and not A, then we should be changing this on a square square root uh, scale. So I hope that makes sense. And it's 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 a subtle change in here because you're only seeing um, like part of that. But when you have bigger changes, 
um, uh, it, it will tend to underestimate things unless you, you do it this way. So whenever you're doing areas, use a square root scale, okay? Now, uh, what about color luminance? So when you're doing color luminance, uh, basically, uh, let's go back in here to showing like five dots, five points, and then actually could be like a little bit bigger, like something like this. And then uh, in this, basically what you will change is a color. And then for that, what you need to create, it's a D3 scale sequential. And this is a scale that allows you to use colors. So for uh, whenever you're using luminance, that it's kind of like the perceived brightness of the element, it's just a matter of using an interpolate uh, grace scale. And then when you're using that, that is replacing your range. So basically what you're doing in here is that this interpolator is going to be your range. I think this doesn't have the nice. And then basically this is going to return me colors whenever I pass data elements. Uh, this one, I don't care if they don't start on zero. So actually I can use the full extent of the, of the range of colors. So I can do this. And then finally, what I need to change in here is the style of the circle and then changing the fill. And then basically it's the same thing. So D dot quantitative attribute, uh, mine is in a space, there we go. And then as you can see, it's just showing that. So it's pretty much similar to what you saw in here, okay? So uh, that is for color luminance. Um, usually you will go with grayscales for that. If you wanna use color saturation, uh, then basically it's going to be exactly the same, but instead of using that, uh, you will use a different color. Like uh, in this case, greens or blues or red, like one of the classical ones that you find is like the blues ones. And then basically what they are changing in there is the saturation. So pretty much when, when you're using color attributes, uh, for this, you just have to use one of the scales that are defined in, in the scale chromatic uh, scale. So this one, it's a little bit more interesting. So I think for this, we should go copy in, um, let's start with, <coughs> with the circles on the top here. So the curvature is going to be more, it's a little bit harder to make. So let's start with this and then let's say that like the first thing is that we're not going to be using circles you should be using paths remember that svg paths are the ones that allow you to draw uh, stuff so basically in here i don't have this and pretty much you don't have any of those elements so actually the only thing i have is the d parameter remember the d parameter on a path on svg determines how it looks so i'm going to have my accessor function and then in there i'm going to say like this is my x sub zero which in this case is going to be this so something like this and then my y sub zero it's going to be height house okay and then what i need to build in here is that i need to uh, return a path i need to return a path that is going to have a formula uh, that first in this case i'm going to move to x zero all right uh, x0 uh, and then uh, y0 and then I have to say for instance draw a line to x0 then y1 where y1 because I'm going to draw a vertical line so basically it's moving to x0 y0 and then drawing a line to x1 x0 y1 and I need y1 that is going to be uh, y0 plus uh, 50 or whatever you want to use in there and then if you return this uh, and of course I'm not showing that oh I should be using this like since I'm selecting things by row I should be saying this is a row and then uh, when you do that then let's see how it is looking in there so basically this is not drawing so let us inspect and see what we are generating in there and as you can see we do have the paths they are putting the elements but then you can see that this one didn't got encoded correctly so that's because i missed this element were you paying attention to that there we go so now i can say actually this is going to be starting i don't know like in 20 instead of hide uh halves and then now i have this element 
let's say this is going to be only 20. So I actually, uh, maybe a little bit more. So since I want to do a curvature, then you have to start looking at the way that SVG works. In this case, you can draw a spline on, on SVG using the Q command. And I think that means a quadratic spline. So the nice thing about spline is that instead of drawing a line like this, you just pass uh, not only the last point, that is that one in there, but you also say a middle point. And that middle point in this case could be, for instance, like y sub zero minus uh, y sub zero y sub one minus y sub zero divided by two. So I'm pretty much basically putting a middle point that is going to be like the half of the space in there. And then if I do that, then I get this. And then if I start adding something, for instance, in here, 50, then it's, it's pretty much what I'm saying is putting three points like x0, y0, then one that is a little bit moved to the right, in this case, 50 pixels, and then the final one. And that gives me the curvature. Now, I, that is what I want to control. So basically in here, what I'm going to have, it's got, I'm going to have um, like a curvature in here curvature scale that is going to be a scale that is going to go from the D3 extent to, to that. You can decide maybe for curvature, cool makes sense. Like since this is not a channel that is used that much, so that's not that much debated. But you can say that this goes from zero to 50 or like as being 50 my maximum. And then the key here will be just using curvature of uh, D dot quantitative attribute, okay? So again, uh, like everything you do with D3 for encoding channels, it's just a matter of, of modifying how much, like modifying the whatever attribute you're changing, in this case, the curvature. If you wanna go and say that the ones that are completely straight um, are going to be uh, zero, then you can change that just by using extent. But just came to mind that it could be more useful like this. The problem of this is that you will, you will not see that much change but it's a little bit evident that this one is smaller than the other okay so that is curvature and that is the ones that you use for quantitative data so remember like we have been doing all of this for um the big length and that is a quantitative attribute so what about uh like a species that is a categorical attribute so if you go back to the scales then you can use a spatial region color hue motion and shape let's see if we can pull this one so uh, let's start again with the first one we made. And then you're going to see that, uh, for instance, for using the color hue, this one is an easy one. So basically you can just go and create um, <coughs> a color uh, scale. In this case, that color scale can be, for instance, a scale ordinal. When you create a scale ordinal, instead of creating passing two parameters as you did on the scale linear, you have to pass all of the possible values of the scale. So in this case, I'm going to say, for instance, let's take my data, get only out of the data, I'm uh, going to get only the D dot um, categorical attribute that you can see I had it selected here, nicely prepared for this. And then that is going to give me all of the possible values, but I only want to see them once. So that's and actually uh, something I recommend you doing and that I do all the time. Whenever you're dubious about what you're getting in there is that you can just pass that into another cell. So as you can see, this is duplicating things. So I actually can pass that to a set. That's going to give me a set. And then if you want to get the actual values, then you can get it like this. And uh, actually you can pass this to uh, D3, but if you want to get it, directly uh, in here, you can create an array from these. I think this is how you do it, and that converts it into an array. But for the moment, this will be enough. So basically what this formula is doing is that this is going to return all of the possible values that I have. And then the range for this, you can either put your own colors, or again, you can use one of the scales that D3 comes with. So in this case, you can see, I wanna use schemes, for instance, category 10 is the basic one, and then the key here will be changing the fill of the circle to be uh, the color of the dot quantitative or categorical attribute. Chan, chan. Then, of course, I am missing something. Um, chan. <coughs> Let me remove this from here that I don't need it anymore. 
and let's take a look at what this is doing in here um, so it does have the attribute oh yes so basically I changed the attribute but I actually have a CSS rule in here that it's saying that everything that it's a circle should be blue that's why it wasn't being changed so I actually need to change the style to override that rule and then you can see the values in there okay so uh, that's that's how you actually encode a color hue uh, I forgot I that's the one I was looking for so I actually I can do this one also for the spatial region so if you want to do a spatial region it will be like basically the same thing but instead of encoding X that we were using that encoding for encoding like position like for the quantitative attribute with and that is expressed in the theory from Tamara when it's a categorical attribute you need to do separate align and order separate order and align so for doing that you do you can do that like the obvious one will be to do also an ordinal but actually there is another one that is called a scale band and in this case the key is passing again like all of these different elements and the beauty of a scale band versus a scale ordinal is that scale ordinal will take uh, like an array for the domain like 10 elements for the domain then you need an array with 10 elements from the range in this case the scale band will take uh, like a sequence of numbers you know that it's or a sequence of values and then it's going to convert that into a range of numbers like a start and an ending and it's going to distribute equally inside that so I can actually keep on using the same attribute that you have in here and then nice doesn't apply to that so I can get rid of that and then now you can see all of the different elements now the only thing I need to change is that this was being applied to the quantitative attribute I just need to change it to the categorical attribute and then as you can see like all of this space is going to be for Adelie penguins penguins whatever you pronounce that but the dot is at the beginning so actually when you create a scale band and these are the scales that you use for for bar charts you also get an extra thing that is the bandwidth so you can say I'm going to pass the bandwidth in here and then of course I always forget that this is lowercase w that is went to the other side so I can just say you know what this is going to be half and then I can put them in, in there so that is one way now you are double encoding but if you just want to use like you can get rid of this now so so that will be just separating by spatial region will be just like this all of the dots are in the same position if you want to separate them a little bit more then you can just do for the sake of demonstration just a bit of bit a little bit of math random for this ah and that is that send it uh, everyone to the same position if you put that in a function they're going to be distributed and then now you can see there is around 100 penguins of each one of those categories of course that's not visible in here but you get the idea okay so categorical you have spatial region separate order and align color hue you're using call you use color hues like this I forgot to tell you that you can change this with different ones for instance separate with a, a scheme accent or oh, there is a one there are some that are that will work very well for penguins um, being them cute and all of that like pastel colors okay uh, motions is a little bit harder so let's go first with shape and for shape I actually yeah, let's start with this one so with shape you can search for instance on observable and let's see if I can get it in here um, observable and then um, there is something called d3 symbol and then hopefully we can see there like this is a good scale that you can use and then this is fields notebook on scale ordinal and then you can see different applications for this always take a look at all of these elements these are really nice um, and then here here are the symbols basically when you're going to be using scale symbol what you need to do is create a scale in this case a scale ordinal and the range is going to be the symbols and then when you apply it then you need to do all of these things so let's see if I can remember all of that so first I am going to change this let's say I'm going to change this one so I'm going to call that symbol okay this is my scale uh, the scale is not going to use a scheme like this it's actually going to use a range and then my ranges are going to be all the possible symbols if you take a look at what this is hopefully you will see that uh, these are all the possible symbols that you have like in this case all the different ways of drawing okay so doing that now I'm not going to use this 
I'm going to get rid of this. Instead of using circles, you should be using paths. Since we are using paths, then the only thing uh, that you need in here, it's actually to, um, to change uh, the attribute the. Remember, same thing that we did before. Okay, so um, let's say these are going to be my symbols. And then uh, I need to have uh, something that allows me to build those symbols. So in this case, I'm going to say this is my symbol. And you create that by saying, I think it's symbol, D3 symbol. And then you say, uh, what is the size that you have of that? In this case, 50 pixels, which I think is going to be the area. So it's something like this, okay? So in then, the, the only thing that is remains in here is that you need to move things. Uh, so in this case, let's put this on a transform with a translate. Translate. Uh, and then I can pass like this one in here. Uh, or actually, if we want to get rid already altogether about the other one, we can, let's say that we are not going, or the, for the moment, let's put it in there and I'm going to change that in a minute. And then in this one, I'm going to say it's, the, remember the mat random that we have? So let's say mat random of height halves. So now we can get rid of this because paths don't have CX and CY, they don't have centers. And then here comes the interesting one. So basically in here, I am going to be going from my symbols that are my categorical attributes. So basically I'm going to be applying this scale. This is the scale that I have. I'm going to apply that scale on whatever categorical attribute I have. And that what that is going to return, it's, uh, I think I have like this is better. Close that, close that. So this is going to return the type of symbol that I'm going to be showing. And then um, I have to take my symbol generator and pass this thing that is going to be the way that I'm drawing to that. And when I do that, then I am missing this. So I'm setting this class. So it actually has um, a stroke because remember, like I have this rule in here. So this has a stroke that is still blue and it's still not showing. Let me see if I'm missing something in here. So a symbol type and then symbols, blah, blah, blah. And yes, and that will return a function and I need to call that function. This is overly complicated. And usually you, it's not that common to use visualizations like this. And now you can see I have all sorts of symbols in each one of the different, on the different positions. Right now they are distributed on the X attribute. Uh, I call like, that is a quantitative attribute. I can be just as well distributing just for the sake of simplifying the demo, just saying like random multiply by the width, like I, the I width, I think. And then with that, I don't need this scale. And then I also can get rid of the axis. So one thing to remember though, is that when you're using something like this, you have to provide a legend. So I'm not going to cover the legend for the sake of, of time. Then I am just missing the, the other one. So to, to recap this one, because it was a little bit complicated. So uh, you create a symbol generator that is this one. This is just uh, some jargon for having something that in the tree that helps you draw in the circle, the, the symbol, sorry. This is my actual scale. My scale is a scale ordinal that goes from all the, the um, uh, penguins, uh, um, the penguin species into all the different symbols that D3 has. I think D3 has like five to 10. I'm not sure how many they have. And then basically what I'm doing is that I'm creating paths and that's the way you use symbols on D3. And then we're changing the attribute D. Oh, sorry, here. We are changing the attribute D. And in that attribute D, we're using our symbol generator with whatever symbol is selected by the scale. That returns a function and that's what I'm calling in here. And sorry, it's like the syntax is a little bit complicated. So now let's go with this one. So for this one, I think this will be a better example to use. Um, Actually, let me use uh, this one rather. So motion, it's a little bit difficult because when you actually look at this and actually just realize this by looking, uh, by preparing this thing, there is a new thing on SVG that it's called SVG animation. And then if you go to the Mozilla Developer Network for SVG animation, then you're going to see that you can animate something by passing something like this. So let's copy this and then start with that. 
So basically, I want to animate my circles. And then the way I want to animate them is that I need to add an animate tag. So this goes inside the circle. So I, it's as easy as just saying append uh, animate. And then I need to change all of these properties. So I'm going to say that I'm going to change the property attribute name and the value for that. Let's say, for instance, for the moment that we're going to change the CX property, then uh, we need to change the values. And then we can say that this is going to be going from zero to five or to zero. In this case, for instance, let's change the radius. That is going to be more evident. And then if I leave it like this, I need to close this thing. Then uh, this is not showing. So I need to pass also the duration, probably minimum thing to do. So and the duration in this case, let's say it's going to be one second. And then now you can see that it created one animation and then it stopped. So if I want to have that indefinite, then I can say also the repeat count. So repeat count. And then I can say this is going to be indefinite. OK, so if I do that, then you can see now they are all checking. I need to differentiate them. So I'm going to do that in a second. You can also change this like this. So you can say this is going to be changing the CX. If I change the CX, then it's going to move everything back there. But I actually want to do it in a relative way. So I can use translate again for, for doing that. So instead of changing CX, I am actually going to move everything with translate. So the nice thing about doing that is that uh, when you translate, um, it's pretty much like the CX and the CY, they become uh, like relative. So I can move things to this position like here and this position in Y. I just need to make sure this is a function. OK, and then by doing that, this looks better. Uh, I don't need the CX and the CY anymore. And now there are each one of them is in their position. So now I can start changing other things. Like now I can start deciding what I'm going to differentiate them with. So for instance, I can say that each one of them is going to move at a different time. So let's create another scale. In this case, um, I need to generate a scale that, for instance, for the first one gives it zero seconds for the second one. So that one is not going to be moving. The other one is going to be moving in, I don't know, like 0.5. And the other one is going to be moving in one. So if you want something like that, you actually can use a scale band it's just a matter of deciding something like this. OK, so and then the key here is that you will decide this to be um, um, and this is my duration. So I just put my duration in here. So this can be my duration out of my D on my categorical attribute. So remember what I'm doing in there is that I'm taking the value of my um, of my datum, my grown on the categorical attribute, passing that through the scale. And then just for SVG, I'm going to add this, the seconds in there. So when you do that, then you can see now that I have one that is moving really fast, one that is not moving, and the other one that is moving a little bit slow. Like the other way you could do this is that you could also say, you know what, I am also going to change. Like you can change all of these things. And basically what D3 is doing is modifying the SVG, the, the DOM. So you can, for instance, change this one too. So. I also can say in here, I'm going to change the attribute name out of my D dot, same thing, a categorical attribute. And then I just need to create that scale. And that scale is going to be an attribute name. This one is going to be a scale that goes uh, from a range of attributes to a range of strings. So since I have three values, instead of a scale band, it should be a scale ordinal. So scale ordinal, remember, you have 10 domains, then you need 10 ranges. Uh, in scale band, you have a 10 uh, domains, domain elements, and then it's going to be distributed across a, a, a domain, a range in here that it's a continuous range. So in this case, I can say this one isn't going to change anything. This is going to be changing CX and the other one is going to be changing CY. And when you do that, of course, you make a mistake. Um, what did I do? Uh, what is there that it's saying? A dur has already been declared. Sorry about that. I did it twice. So I can do this. 
And then now you can see this one is moving up and down and also moving slower. These ones are moving to the side. So then you can test those. If you want to see how differentiable these are, so let's say that instead of using the X scale, let's go with uh, the math random, multiply by the width, for instance, the I width, for instance. In this case, I'm going to get rid of the X scale. So I'm going to delete this. And then I am going to delete this scale. And if you do that, then now you have them in there. And I don't know, I don't find them that differentiable, but I guess we will need an experiment. Okay, so to wrap up, this is the way that you encode uh, channels from um, in D3, depending, remember you use quantitative attributes for magnitude channels, and you have categorical attributes for identity channels. And then for each one of these, you use different scales. For these ones, you use scale linear, scale linear, scale linear. The only difference is that this one starts in a different point. You also can use a scale linear in here, just, just use a different range. You use a square, a square root scale because we are using radius or you're also, if you're using sides, then you can also do that with paths, with areas or rectangles. So in that case, make sure that you also use a square root because like of the formula of how you're computing that. Depth, I didn't show you because SVG, because first, I don't recommend you to use that. And second, with SVG, it's a little complicated. Here, you just use a scale sequential and make sure that you use a scale grace for that. This one, you also use a scale sequential, but using one of the interpolators, it can be interpolate reds or greens. L take a look at uh, a scale chromatic. For curvatures, you use paths, and then you use a scale linear that changes that middle point of the spline. So that's one way that I did it. Spatial region, you use scale bands. And remember, you have that band with in there. Scale ordinal for these ones with one of the skins. Uh, for motion, it was way more complicated, but at the end, it was just a matter of choosing what was the thing that you wanted to move. And the scale shape also has a complicated sy syntax, but at the end, it was only a scale ordinal. So you can combine this, and then hopefully you can use this in your visualizations.